Welcome to the lecture on increasing, decreasing, even, odd, and average rates of change. This lecture is going to discuss different characteristics of graphs and functions. And we're going to start with deciding whether or not a function is considered increasing or decreasing. So let's start with some definitions. Formally, a function is considered increasing on an open interval if, for any choice of a and b in that interval, with a being less than b, then f of a is less than f of b. And what that informally means is that your graph has to rise up from the left to the right. So let's draw a picture so that we can visualize what's going on. So imagine just a typical graph that rises from left to right. The a and the b are your x values, which correspond to points on our graph. And the y coordinates of those points would be f of a and f of b. So if you compare a is less than b because it's further to the left, but f of a is also smaller than f of b, so we're maintaining these two restrictions. If a is less than b, then f of a will also be less than b. So what that means is that your graph starts off smaller and gets bigger as you move to the right. So it's your typical idea of a function that's rising. Now let's talk about a decreasing function. Formally, we would say that a function decreases if instead it falls, and if you imagine an A and a B, and an F of A and an F of B being the two heights, you can see that even though A is smaller than B, F of A is bigger than F of B. So F of A is larger or greater than F of B, when a is less than b. So that means the graph has to fall. It has to start higher and end lower. Now a function is considered constant if no matter what choice you choose for x in that interval, all of the function values, all of the y values are equal. So this is just going to look like a horizontal line as you go from left to right. So no matter whether I pick this x or this x, they both share the same y. They're both equal. So one common thing that you're going to be asked to do is decide by looking at a graph whether or not the graph is increasing, decreasing, or constant, and give the intervals where it increases, decreases, and is constant. So we want to find out where this increases. And when we write that out, we're going to write it as intervals of x values. So we're going to give all of the x values where this graph rises. Now we're going to do the same thing for where the graph decreases and where it's constant. So if we look at this graph starting on the left, you can see that from this point down to here, the graph falls. And what x values does that correspond to? We've got negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4 is this left point and negative 3 is the bottom point. So the graph initially decreases from negative 4 down to negative 3, and then after negative 3, what does it do? It starts rising up until we get to this x value of 0. So from negative 3 up to 0, the graph rises or increases. Then from 0 all the way across this flat horizontal section, we're constant, and that goes up until an x value of positive 3. So between 0 and 3, for all those x values, the graph is constant. And then after 3, up until 1, 2, 3, let's see, 4, 5, 6, when x is 6, so for all of these x values here, the graph is falling again. So from 3 to 6, it falls, and since this decreasing interval, there's two of them, we usually just put a union symbol in between to show that we want both of those in our solution. Now one other thing to note here, I did use open parentheses around these endpoints, and that's just a habit that I learned when I was going to school. When you're at those particular endpoints where you might have these little breaks or these mins or these maxes, you're not technically increasing there or decreasing there, just in between. So I like to use open parentheses around all of my input, all of my endpoints. So now we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to do 
a function that's a little bit more complicated and we're going to use our calculator to help us figure out where the graph increases and decreases. So first thing we need to do is graph this guy. So let's go ahead and go to our calculator and go to our y equals and type in our function. So I need negative x raised to the fourth plus x raised to the third plus 3x squared minus x plus 18. Now I have no idea what kind of window I'm going to need for this. So I'm going to initially start with the standard window. So I'm going to go to zoom standard, which is option 6. That's going to give me a window between negative 10 to 10 for x's and negative 10 to 10 for y's. And you can see from this graph in this window that I have a lot of dead space to the left and to the right. So probably my x dimensions don't need to be quite as large. So I don't need to go from negative 10 to 10. Maybe I could just go from negative 5 to 5. So we're going to narrow up that window. But in the y direction, I'm obviously missing some important parts of this graph because I don't see how high or how low it goes. So we do want to increase the y dimensions. So let's go to our window. And I'm going to narrow in my x min and my x max and just go from negative 5 to 5 with a scale of 1. And for my y's, I want to make these a little bit longer or larger. So let's try, this is just a guess, let's try negative 25 to positive 25. And I might use a scale of 5 since that's getting sort of large. And let's hit graph. So we got pretty lucky here with our window dimensions because this looks like a typical fourth degree polynomial. It has kind of that W shape to it, but this one's pointing down because the x to the fourth had a negative in front. So this looks very characteristic of what the graph should look like. So we have all of our important pieces in place. And what we want to decide is where it increases and where it decreases. So I'm going to draw a little replica of this graph. And if you're doing this on a test or a quiz, if the question is worded like this one is, it's always a good idea to show a copy of your graph on your test so that your instructor can see where you're getting your information from. They can't see your calculator, but if you make a duplicate copy of that graph on your calculator, then they'll know that you were graphing the right function and they'll be able to assess your answer. So our graph looks something like this, and I'm putting dots at these key points. You can kind of see that the graph rises up until I hit this little peak, and then, oops, sorry about that, and then it falls till I hit this little min right here, and then I rise up again till I hit that other peak, and then I fall again as I go down. So the maximums here and here are very important to know about. And this minimum right here is very important to know about as well. So we need to figure those out on our calculator. Now you certainly could trace, but tracing on your calculator isn't very exact. And there is commands on your calculator that allow you to locate maximums and minimums. So that's what we're going to use. And it's right under this calc command on your calculator, right above trace. So we're going to hit second trace. And you can see option three is minimum and option four is maximum. So let's find our maximums first. So I'm going to do number four. And what it's going to ask for is a left bound and a right bound, just like it does when you're trying to find zeros. So if I want to find this maximum that's over here on the left hand side, I'm going to want to arrow over to the left, just a little bit to the left of where I think that peak is. Hit enter. Now I'm going to arrow just a little bit to the right of where I think that peak is. Hit enter. And then I'm going to back up and try to put my cursor as close to where that peak is and then hit enter for the guess. So this um, maximum you can see has coordinates negative point nine 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 and so on with a y equal to 20. Now that's close enough to me to negative one that I would go ahead and round that off. So the coordinates of this point are negative 1 for x, 20 for y. Okay, let's do that again, but this time we're going to find the maximum that's over here on the right hand side. So I'm going to go back to calc, which is second trace, 
going to find another maximum, so I'm going to hit number 4. And I'm trying to find the one that's over in quadrant 1, so I'm going to arrow over to the right. And it's kind of hard to see because that equation is up there. But you want to get your cursor just a little bit to the left of where you think that peak is. Hit enter. Then arrow to the right and go a little bit to the right of where that peak is. Hit enter. And then back up to where that maximum is. Hit enter. And here's our maximum. So the coordinates of this guy is 1.593. I'm just going to round off to three decimal places. Comma 21.623. So we have our two maxes. Let's find our min. So I'm going to go back to calc. Second, trace. And this time we're going to find a minimum, which is option three. And the min is right, right here near that y-axis. So I'm going to go down to where that little tiny dip is, to a little bit to the left of where the dip is. Hit enter. Arrow back to the right, a little bit to the right of where the dip is and then back to where that min seems to be. Hit enter. So the location of this min is at 0.157 comma 17.920. All right, we've located all of our maxes and our mins, so now we should be able to write out where this increases and where it decreases. And remember that when you're finding these intervals of increase and decrease, you're finding intervals involving the x-coordinates. So your intervals that you write should use x-coordinates only. We don't need to worry about the y-values, even though I found those. It's just the x-values that we want to know. So if we look to the left of our graph, start at the leftmost part of the graph, the graph is rising until I get to that first peak. So the graph is increasing for all of these x's. And this continues on and on forever. So this is going to keep going more and more to the left on my graph, which means it's going more and more towards negative infinity. So this graph initially starts increasing from minus infinity until it hits that negative 1. And again, I'm going to use an open parenthesis around that endpoint. Then after that x value of negative 1, it falls until we hit that little min. So that's from negative 1 until the x coordinate of this minimum, which was this 0.157, using parentheses. Then after that 0.157, this little stretch of the graph here, I rise up again. So from 0.157, that little min, up to the second max, which was at 1.593, I rise up. And then after that peak, I fall back down again. So I decrease from 1.593 on to infinity. And you're going to put union symbols in between. Okay, so we have two intervals of increase and two intervals of decrease. Now notice in the last two examples that we did, when the graph changed from increasing to decreasing, it had a maximum. And you can see that here when I went from rising up down to falling. So when I increased and then I decreased, the change happened right at that maximum. And the same on this side over here. When I rise up to the left of that max, then I fall down to the right of it. So whenever you change from increasing to decreasing, you're going to have a maximum at the point where it changes, and that's called a local maximum. Vice versa, if you switch from decreasing to increasing, like we do at this min, I fall to the left, but then I rise up to the right, then that's going to cause you to have a minimum, a local minimum. So we say that a function f has a local max if that value, that y value, is greater than all the other values near it. Okay, so that's kind of your idea of what a max should be, right? If you imagine a little peak right here, you have a max at x equals to c, 
if the y value at that c is bigger than all the other y values near it. That's the definition of a local maximum. And you can have that maximum as long as you are increasing to the left and then decreasing to the right. On the other side of this, you would have a local minimum if that y value at c is the smallest y near c. So for example, imagine a little valley here where we have a minimum at x equals to c. Then obviously that y value right at c is the smallest y value close by. So that's what makes it a local minimum. And you're going to have a local minimum when your graph falls to the left or decreases on the left side and then increases on the right side of that C. This is a very important stuff that you will see again in calculus if you go on to take calculus. Maximums and minimums. Okay, let's go ahead and try another example where we're given a function 6x cubed minus 12x plus 5 and we want to find out where it is increasing and decreasing and also locate its local maxes and mins. So I'm going to go back to my calculator. I'm going to clear out my function and I'm going to type in 6x to the third minus 12x plus 5. And I have no idea what window needs to work here again, so let's start with our zoom standard. And here's our graph, and this is a cubic function, so we can sort of see that cubic shape, but we're kind of missing this little peak that we sort of expect to see up here. And also you can see for the x's that we have a lot of dead space to the left and to the right, so the x dimensions are probably too big, and the y dimensions are a little bit too small. We need to at least boost that y max up a little bit so that we can see that peak. So let's go ahead and adjust our window. Let's change our x min to negative 5 and our x max to 5. And the y min was fine. We were definitely seeing low enough on the graph. It was just the height of the graph that we couldn't see. So let's boost up our y max to maybe 25 and change our y scale to 5 and hit graph. So there's that typical cubic shape that we would expect. So we're looking at a good graph. And what we want to figure out are the locations of the local max, which is going to be right up here, and the local min, which is down here. And then based on those, we'll be able to see where it increases, decreases, and then increases again. So to find local maxes and mins using your calculator, you use that calc button. So we're going to hit second, trace, Let's find our maximum first, so number 4. And the maximum is over here on the left, so I'm going to go a little bit to the left of that peak, hit enter. Then go a little bit to the right of where that peak is, hit enter. And then back up right to where that peak is, and hit enter. So our maximum has coordinates. Let me draw a little sample graph here to refer to. So we have something that looks kind of like this. And this maximum is at negative 0.816 comma 11.532. Just rounding off there a little bit. Okay, let's find this min next. Okay, we want to find the location of that min. So go back to calc, second trace. And I'm going to do number three. And I'm going to arrow to the right. And I want to be just to the left side of that min. So a little bit to the left of it, hit enter. Then a little bit to the right of it, hit enter. And then back up to where that dip is and hit enter. So our coordinates of our min are positive 0.816 comma negative 1.532. So our max our local max would be this top one. So negative 0.816 comma 11.532. It's always safe to give both the x and the y coordinate when you're talking about your maxes and your mins. And we have a local min at this bottom point, 
positive 0.816 comma negative 1.532. And then this increases starting on the left, we rise up until we hit that max. So from minus infinity up until this x coordinate. Remember, for intervals of increase and decreasing, you're only referring to the x values. So minus infinity up until negative 0.816. Then once I reach that peak, then I have to fall down to hit that min. So from the x value of the peak, which was negative 0.816, up to the x value of the min, which was positive 0.816, that's where I fall or decrease. And then after that min, I rise up again. So from positive 0.816 up to infinity, I'm going to keep rising, and I'm going to put a union in between. Okay. So be able to find intervals of increase and decrease, be able to locate a maximum and a minimum using your calculator. Okay, now we're going to switch gears and talk about symmetry. If you remember from previous lectures, we talked about several different kinds of symmetry, and we're going to review two of them today. The first one being symmetry about the y-axis. And we had a test for this to decide whether or not a function was symmetric about the y-axis. And what we did for the test was to replace all the x's in the formula for the function with minus x's, simplify, and if we got back the original function, then we said it did have symmetry about the y-axis. Another name for symmetry about the y-axis is the function being even. So we'll see that quite often today and talk about that a little bit more today. Another type of symmetry that we talked about is symmetry about the origin, and the test that we had for this was to replace both x with minus x and y with minus y. And if you got back the original function, then we would say it has symmetry about the origin or that it was odd. Now, if we talk about these kinds of symmetries in function notation, then you have a slightly different looking formula or definition of what it means to be even or odd, but they mean exactly the same thing as what we just talked about. So in function notation, we would say that a function f is even if f of minus x gives you back exactly the same thing as f of x. So in other words, if you replace the input x with minus x, you're going to get exactly the same value for your function as if you had just used x in the first place. So the two function values are the same. For an odd function, what we're going to say is that you have an odd function if when you replace minus x in for your input, you don't get back the original f of x, but you get back its opposite. So plugging in a minus x gives you back a minus y. And that's why you have in our definition of odd that you have to replace both x with its opposite and y with its opposite in order to get back to the original. So these are just two alternative definitions for deciding whether or not something is even or odd. And in the next group of problems that we're going to do, you're going to be asked to solve or show algebraically whether or not a function is even, odd, or neither. And the way to do that algebraically is to actually show these two definitions. So what you would want to do is always start by substituting in a minus x into your function and then see what develops. If you simplify and you get back the original function f of x, then we would say the function is even. If you simplify and you get back the opposite of f of x, then we would say that it's odd. And if you simplify and don't get back either the original or the opposite of f, then you'd say that it's neither. So your first step is always to figure out what happens when you plug in minus x, and then you just kind of simplify from there and see what happens. So let's try some examples. So this would give, be a typical type of problem that you would be expected to do, and it's going to ask you specifically to show algebraically whether or not the functions are even, odd, or neither. So we will verify these on a graph, but you do need to know how to do these algebraically, which means using those definitions that we just talked about. So the first function here, 
is 5x cubed minus x. Now just looking at those powers, x cubed and x to the first, you would probably suspect, because those are odd powers, that this is an odd function. So that's what we're going to try to verify. So just to kind of um, refresh our memory here and to keep this as reference, remember that something is even if when you substitute in minus x into your function, you get back f of x. And something is odd if you substitute in minus x, you don't get back the original function, but you get back its opposite, so minus f of x. So these are what we're going to use to try and prove whether or not something is even or odd. So your first step in a proof is always to substitute in the opposite of x. So we're going to replace this input x with minus x. And when I do that, these two x's in our formula need to get replaced with minus x, but make sure you use parentheses here. So if I use as my new input minus x, this would look like 5 times the quantity minus x cubed minus minus x. So I just replaced my inputs with the new input. And now we want to simplify this. Because we have an odd power, this negative that's inside these parentheses is going to stick around. So the x does get cubed, but that minus stays put. And just to make it look a little cleaner or prettier, I'm going to go ahead and pull that minus all the way out front in front of my coefficient. So 5 times negative x quantity cubed would turn out to be the same as negative 5 x cubed. Now on this one, this is again raised to a first power, so that negative is going to stay put. But because we have subtraction, minus minus becomes plus, so this becomes a plus x on the side. Now, when we go to compare our two functions, initially this does not look like the original function. But we might be able to manipulate it a little bit. Remember how we sort of guessed that this was probably an odd function? So if that's the case, then this answer that we got should be the opposite, or minus, times the original function. So one way to show that is to factor out this negative. If I factor out the negative from both of these terms, I'll be left with positive 5x cubed, and this plus x would change to a minus x. So now, 5x cubed minus x, hey, that is f of x. That's exactly what f of x is. And I got it after I factored out the negative. So we just proved that f of minus x equals minus f of x. And that means this is an odd function. Now let's verify that on a graph. So let's go to y equals, clear this out, and do 5x to the third minus x. And I'm just going to do a standard window. And what we're looking for is symmetry around the origin, because that's what being odd means. This means that it's symmetric over the origin. And hopefully you can agree from this graph that if I were to rotate it around this origin 180 degrees, I would get back the reflection. So yes, it is symmetric over the origin, which means yes, it is an odd function. But the algebraic proof of that would be all of this work up here. All right, let's try another example. So now our function is x over x squared minus 1. So if we want to show whether it's even, odd, or neither, your very first step always is to substitute in minus x for that x. So we're just going to rewrite this function, replacing all of these x's with minus x. So the x on top becomes a minus x, and the x on the bottom becomes a minus x, but I'm going to use parentheses around it because I do have a power. Now when I go to simplify, the negative x on top just has to stay put. That negative doesn't get to go anywhere. But the negative on the bottom next to that square is going to get squared away because it's an even power. So you will just get back a plain old x squared. No more negative. And the minus 1 is on the side. Now you want to compare this answer so far to what we had originally. They're pretty close, but I have that negative on top. So what I'm going to do is take that negative and just pull it out front like a coefficient. 
and think of this as minus the quantity x over x squared minus 1. And this quantity right here is exactly what f of x is. And I pulled out a negative, so that negative is still there. So once again, we have that f of minus x equaled negative f of x, which implies being odd. That's our definition of being an odd function. So let's verify this graphically again. If I go to my y equals, I'm going to do x divided by, and you have to use parentheses around your denominator, so parentheses x squared minus 1, close the parentheses. I'm still in a standard window, so I'm just going to hit graph. And again, if you were to rotate this 180 degrees across that origin, you would get back the same image. So yes, it is symmetric over the origin. Yes, it is odd. Okay, let's try a couple more. f of x equals x squared plus absolute value of x. So to show whether or not this is even, odd, or neither, you always start by plugging in minus x into your function. So this x is going to get replaced with a minus x in parentheses, and the x inside the absolute value gets replaced with a minus x. Now the x, uh, the negative x quantity squared, because that's an even power, that negative that's inside gets squared away. So this becomes a positive x squared. And then what does absolute value do to negatives? It strips them away. So the absolute value of negative x is exactly the same value as the absolute of positive x. So we can simplify that by just removing the negative. For example, you know that absolute value of negative 3 is the same as absolute value of positive 3. So that's true in general, no matter what your x input happens to be. So look at what we got back. x squared plus absolute value of x is exactly our original function. So we got back exactly the same thing as f of x. So f of minus x gave me back f of x. So that means that's the definition of being even. And remember, for symmetry purposes, if you're even, that means you're symmetric across or over the y-axis. So let's verify that with a graph. So I'm going to go to y equals, clear this out, and I'm going to do x squared plus, now to get the absolute value function, if you don't know how to do this, it's hidden under your math button. So once you're in your y equals screen, go and hit math, and you're going to need to arrow to the right once till you get to this num number across the top. So arrow once to the right, and there's abs right at the top. So you can either hit one or you can just hit enter, and it will copy that absolute value function into your y equals. And we wanted the absolute value of x. So type in an x, close your parentheses, and hit graph. And we're looking for a graph that is symmetric over the y-axis. So if you were to reflect this over that y-axis, you would get that same mirror image back. So it looks good. All right, the last example here has um, cube root of x plus 1. So let's go ahead and start off, as always, by substituting in minus x in for our input. So this x under the cube root becomes a minus x, and that plus 1 is on the side. Now think about a cube root. That's an odd root again. So it's OK to have negatives under an odd root. And in fact, if you pull that negative out, you're allowed to because it is odd. So the cube root of x is going to just be, or excuse me, the cube root of negative x is the same as the cube root of positive x, but with the negative pulled out. So we get this function right here, negative cube root of x plus 1. Does that look like the original? Not quite, because we have this minus sign. So let's see what would happen if we were to factor out a negative. If I were to factor out a negative, then I would be left with a positive cube root of x, but this plus 1 would have to change to a minus 1. Is this the same as the original? 
no because of the different signs in front of that one. So unfortunately, this is not going to be the opposite of f of x. It doesn't quite match. So what does that mean? It means we have neither type of symmetry. It's ne neither even nor odd. And let's sort of see from a graph why this might be. Let's go to our y equals. And I want to do a cube root. So again, that's hidden under your math button. So if you go to math, you can see option number four here is a built-in cube root fu function. So let's type in four. And I want cube root of just the x. And then I wanted a plus one on the side. That what was, that's what my original function f of x was. Let's hit graph. And we're looking to see if it has any kind of symmetry. And it's a little hard to tell. You might need to zoom in on your window here a little bit if you want to. But you can see that this does not pass through the origin. It's just a little bit to the left of it. Let's, let's change our window dimensions here a little bit. Let's go from negative 5 to 5 for x's and negative 5 to 5 for y's. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. And you can see that this graph has been shifted up one unit onto that y-axis. So if I were to reflect this around the origin, it's not going to copy right on itself. So that's why this doesn't have any kind of symmetry, and it's neither even nor odd. Okay, let's try a couple of problems that are similar but a little bit different and sometimes confusing for students. Suppose that you have the graph of a function. We know nothing about it except that this graph contains the point 4, comma, negative 1. Based on just that information, what point is guaranteed to be on the graph of f if we know that f is positive? Okay, so let's visualize this for a moment. If we have some mysterious graph, the only thing I know about it is that it contains the point 4, comma, negative 1. If this graph is even, remember what that means. It means you're symmetric across the y-axis. So that means I have to be able to reflect this over that y-axis. And that means you re replace this x value with its opposite and get back the same y value. So hopefully you can see that if I reflect that point over that y-axis, it would have to hit right here to maintain that symmetry. And what would be the coordinates of this point? Well, minus 4, because we're on the other side of the origin, but still at a height of negative 1. So negative 4 comma negative 1 would have to also be on this graph if the original function f was even. Okay, let's try this again. But this time we're going to assume that the graph is odd. So if my point initially is 4 comma negative 1, this time we have to rotate this around that origin. So this time you're not only changing the x to its opposite, but you're also changing the y to its opposite. Let me move that arrow out of the way for a moment. So we're going around this way. So the 4 changes to its opposite and becomes minus 4. And the y changes to its opposite as well and becomes plus 1. And you can kind of see that that symmetry of going over the origin means anything that was in quadrant 4 would have to get reflected into quadrant 2. If it had started in quadrant 1, then it would have to get reflected to quadrant 3 and vice versa. So the coordinates of this point would be minus 4, comma, positive 1. So negative 4, comma, 1 would have to be on the graph as well if this is symmetric over the origin or odd. Now this last one here is a little bit trickier to figure out. We want to figure out what point must be on the graph of this new curve. y equals 2 times f of x plus 3. So we're doing some shifts and some transformations to this function. Um, we haven't necessarily talked about this yet in this course, but that plus 3 vertically shifts your graph up 3 units, and the 2 stretches your graph vertically by 2 as well. So we're making some changes to our graph, and we want to know what change happens to this point 4, comma, negative 1. So if 4, comma, negative 1 is on your graph, 
Think about that in function notation. The x value here is 4, so if I evaluated my function at 4, what should that output be? Well, it has to be whatever this y value is, so negative 1. So in function notation, the point 4 comma negative 1 really just means f of 4 equals negative 1. So that's the place that you want to start. If you have this formula y equals 2 f of x plus 3, let's let x be 4, because that's the only input here that I know anything about, and let's substitute in 4 for this x. So if I substitute in 4, this is what the formula becomes. Now fortunately, we know what f of 4 is. Remember up here, f of 4 has as its y value negative 1. So this gets replaced with a negative 1, and then what are we doing to that? We're multiplying that output by 2, and then we're adding 3 to that, so it becomes 1. So when x was 4, y was 1. So when x is 4, y is 1, so this would have to be the point 4, 1. So that one's a little bit tricky, but if you think in terms of function notation and just substitute in the x value of the one point you know about and see how that y value changes, you'll be able to get your answer. Okay, again we're going to switch gears here, and this time we're going to talk about something called average rate of change. Now average rate of change is just a fancy way of saying slope. When you're asked to find the average rate of change of a function between two points, like p sub 1, which would be x1, y1, and point 2, p2, which is x2, y2, basically all you're being asked to do is find the slope between those two points. And most of you should already know how to do that, because when you're trying to find the slope between two points, all you have to do is find the change in the y's, and this little triangle symbol here means change, so the change in the y's would be just the difference in the two y's, y2 minus y1, over the change in the x's, x2 minus x1. And it doesn't really matter which point you start with. Usually in these formulas we always see it written as y2 minus y1, but it could just as easily have been written y1 minus y2 over x1 minus x2. So it doesn't matter which point you start with. Now, if instead of thinking of these points as x1s and y1s and x2s and y2s, you could think of them in function notation. So you could think of it as um, x1, comma, f of x sub 1, and x2, comma, f of x sub 2. So if you were to think of it that way instead, the slopes would again be the difference in the y's, which is just the f of x sub 2 minus the f of x sub 1, over the difference in the x's, x sub 2 minus x sub 1, or the change in the function over the change in the x. So average rate of change just means slope between the two points. It's a fancy way of saying that. Now often in other classes, especially in calculus, you will see applications involving average rates of change, and you'll hear about something called a secant line. So a secant line is just the line that goes through two points on your function. So if we have our p1 and our p2, then the secant line would just be this line connecting those two dots. So that's called your secant line. And what happens is that the slope of the secant line turns out to be exactly what we just calculated here, or what we're calling the average rate of change. So you want to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Whenever you hear a reference to the slope of the secant line, that just means the average rate of change, or it just means the slope between the two points. So let's try an example. We're going to look at the function 3x squared minus 2x plus 3. And we want to find the average rate of change of that function from negative 2 to 1. So when you hear negative 2 to 1, you want to understand that that's always implying x values. So you could also have seen this problem written as find the average rate of change of this function on the interval negative 2 to 1. Sometimes you see problems worded that way. 
And these, again, are the x coordinates or the x values that you're being asked to use. So, in other words, we would be looking to find the slope between the two points that have an x value of negative 2 and an x value of 1. So, let's go ahead and figure out what this would look like. So, first, let's go ahead and graph our function. So, let's go to y equals and we have our function already in our calculator here, 3x squared minus 2x plus 3. And I'm just going to start with a standard window just to kind of get a feel for what this looks like. It's a normal parabola pointing up. I have some dead space to the left and to the right, and I really have my graph up fairly high. So I'm going to adjust my window, make my x's a little bit narrower, and maybe start my x min not quite so low at negative 10. Let's move it up a little higher. So let's adjust our window to, let's say, negative 5 to 5. And let's start our y min at 0 and maybe go up to 15, something like that. So here's a nice picture of our parabola. So I'm going to replicate that over here. This is what we're looking at. And what this means when it asks for the average rate of change from negative 2 to 1, negative 2 is the x value and positive 1 is the y uh, and positive 1 is the other x value. So we're looking for the slope of this line which we call the secant line between those two points. That's what average rate of change means. So how do you find slope between two points? Well, you find the changes in the y's over the changes in the x's. So let's go ahead and figure out what these x's and y's are going to be. We already know that the x value of the first point on the left here is negative 2. So how would we figure out what its y value is? Well, we're given this function. So if we know a specific input, namely negative 2, then all I need to do to figure out the output would be to plug in negative 2 into our function. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll do a little scratch work here on the side. If x is negative 2, I'm going to sub substitute negative 2 in for these two x's right here. So this would become, for f of negative 2, 3 times negative 2 squared minus 2 times negative 2 plus 3. And that's going to give me 3 times 4 plus 4 plus 3. That's 12 plus 7. So it looks like this is going to be 19. So if x is negative 2, then y is going to be 19. So there's our first point. This is going to be at a height of 19. Now let's find our other coordinates. So if x is now positive 1, let's find out what the function does at 1. So now I'm going to plug in 1 and find f of 1, so 3 times 1 squared minus 2 times 1 plus 3 gives me 3 minus 2 plus 3, so that looks like it's going to be 4. So this second dot is at a height of 4, 1 comma 4. So all we need to do now to find the average rate of change is find the change in these y's over the change in these x's. And again, it does not matter which point you start with, so I'm just going to go ahead and start with the 19 and subtract the 4. Those are the two y values. And then I'm going to subtract my two corresponding x's, so negative 2 minus 1. So I get 15 over negative 3, and that reduces to negative 5. So my average rate of change is negative 5. Now physically or geometrically what that represents is the slope of this secant line. So the slope of this line is negative 5. And that's going to help us in our next question because the next question says find the equation of this secant line. So if we just found out the slope, that's a very important thing you need to know about for a line. So what else do you have to do to find the equation of a line if you know its slope? Well, in this case, we just calculated that the slope, otherwise known as average rate of change, was negative 5, and 
we had a couple points that we knew about as well. We knew this point up here and this point down here, and we calculated what those were already. It was negative 2, comma 19, and positive 1, comma 4. So how do you find the equation of a line given a couple points and given a slope? Well, there's lots of ways to do that, but one way that I would recommend would be to use something called point-slope form. And this is a good formula to know. It says y minus the y coordinate of your point has to equal the slope m times x minus the x coordinate of your point. Now we have two points, so it doesn't really matter which point you use. It's kind of your choice. You'll get the same final answer no matter which one you use. So I'm going to use the one with all positives. And remember, we also know our slope m. So we've got a y1 and an x1 and we've got an m, and we're just going to plug those into our formula over here and then simplify. So the equation of our line is going to look like this. y minus the y-coordinate 4 equals the slope, which was negative 5, parentheses x minus the x-coordinate 1. And then you just want to clean it up a little bit. So we're going to go ahead and distribute our negative 5 across, so we get negative 5x plus 5, and then I'm going to add 4 to finish solving for y. So our equation becomes y equals negative 5x plus 9. And that's the equation of our secant line, the line connecting these two points that we had initially. Now the average rate of change that we've just been talking about, you can easily think of that as just finding the slope between two points. And we're going to continue to do that in this next formula. However, this formula is going to look slightly different because instead of thinking about two random points, like an x1, y1, and an x2, y2, instead we're going to think about starting at a fixed point and then moving slightly over, either to the right or to the left, from that fixed point and finding the average rate of change over that small interval. So physically to draw a picture here of what's going on. Instead of just picking some x comma y, we're going to pick a base or starting point which has an x value of a. And once we start at that a, we're going to just move slightly over either to the right or to the left. I'm just going to draw it to the right. And so that next x value would be at a plus a little bit more. And Typically we use the letter h to represent that slight change or movement over that we're going from our fixed starting point. So we're just going to calculate the slope of the line between these two points. So we have our starting point or our base point at A, and then our second point on our interval is at A plus a little bit more, or A plus H. And then again, that secant line would just connect the two like this, and you're just finding the slope between those two points. So think about how you would do that to find the change in your F over the change in your x's. Well, what's the function value or the y value at this second dot? It's f evaluated at a plus h. And we want to subtract from that the function value or y value at this first dot, and that's just f of a. And in the denominator, we want to subtract our x's. Well, our second x value was a plus h, and our first x value was a. And if you'll notice in the denominator, if we think in terms of this fixed point or base point, these a's end up canceling out, and what you end up with is f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. And all it is is a slope. It's the same thing as finding the slope between two points. It's just thinking in terms of starting at a fixed point a and moving slightly over to the right or to the left by this amount h. And this is a very, very common thing that we do in mathematics, so we give it a special name. It's called a difference quotient. So this formula right here is the formula for the difference quotient of f on the interval a to a plus h. And you will see this again in calculus quite a bit. Now, why would we bother doing this instead of just doing our x1, y1, x2, y2s? Well, in a lot of questions, you might be asked to find several average rates of change. So if you use this formula from above, you could easily do that by finding the x1s and y1s, 
x twos and y twos, subtracting the y's, subtracting the x's, and computing each of those slopes. As an alternative, if you know what your function is, instead of computing, say, five different slopes every time the points change, let's instead compute one single difference quotient formula that's very generic and very general and has variables still in it. And then, in the end, we could just substitute in a specific a and a specific a plus h, and that way we'll get our answer for those average rates of change without having to do so many computations. In other words, you compute the difference quotient once and then just plug in some numbers at the end versus having to compute these slopes five times for the five different choices or five different problems that you're asked to do. So it's supposed to be a little bit of a time saver. Let me show you what I mean. So for example, suppose we have these functions here. Now these three examples on this page of notes are very, very typical and representative of the style and difficulty of the questions that you would be expected to know on a test or a quiz. So you've got some fairly difficult functions to deal with, the first ones being quadratic here. And instead of finding a specific slope or specific average rate of change over a specific interval, Instead, we're going to find a generic difference quotient, which would represent what that slope or what that average rate of change would equal on any interval. So it's very powerful. It enables you to find these slopes over many different possible intervals instead of just computing a specific slope given specific numbers. So how do we do this? Well, first thing you have to do is remember your formula, and this is something I would recommend that you memorize. So our difference quotient formula was this f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to apply that formula to this function. So if we have f of a plus h minus f of a all over h, the first thing we've got to do is figure out what f of a plus h becomes. And remember that for function notation like this, this basically is implying that we want to replace the input x in our original formula up here, change all of those x's to a plus h's. So instead of having 2x squared, this is going to become 2 parentheses a plus h squared. And instead of having minus x plus 1, we're going to have minus parentheses oops, a plus h plus 1. So this would have been 2x squared minus x plus 1, and now it's 2a plus h squared minus a plus h plus 1. So it looks just like the function f, but we have a different input. So now we're going to do that again for this f of a part. We've already done this, now we need to do this part. So f of a, we're going to change these x's to a's instead. So this formula would become 2a squared minus a plus 1. Now this next step is very, very important because if you miss this, you're going to get the wrong difference quotient. The the thing that we want to do between this f of a plus h and this f of a is find its difference. We want to subtract. So you're going to put the subtraction symbol in between, but we want to subtract all of this f of a from all of this f of a plus h. So it's very important that you have those parentheses. The first set of parentheses really isn't that necessary because there's nothing in front of it that's going to end up being distributed. However, the second set of parentheses is very important because in our next step, we're going to need to distribute that negative across. So there's the difference part, the f of a plus h minus the f of a. Now what we need to finish here is we need to put in the quotient part. So we have to take all of these terms and divide them by h. So let's go ahead and figure out what this is going to be. Now on this first part, like I said just a minute ago, we don't really need these first set of black parentheses. So I'm going to drop those and going into the inside here, think of order of operations. Exponents come first, so you have to square this first before you distribute the two. 
That's a common mistake. So I'm going to leave the 2 where it is first, and then I'm going to go ahead and square, and remember to FOIL here. So we're going to get an a squared plus a 2ah plus an h squared. And then let's go ahead and distribute our negative across to our, ne to our a and our h. And then I'm also going to go ahead and distribute my negative across to those f of a terms. So minus 2a squared plus a minus 1. Okay, one more set of distributing here. Let's go ahead and distribute our 2. So we get 2a squared plus 4ah plus 2h squared. And if you are doing this correctly, then all of these f of a terms on the end should cancel out. So this negative 2a squared cancels with the positive, plus a cancels with minus a, and minus 1 cancels with plus 1. And what we're left with on top are just terms with h's. 4ah plus 2h squared minus h all over h. The nice thing about that is because since all these terms on top have an h in common, I can factor it out like a GCF. And what I'd be left with in parentheses would be 4a plus 2h minus 1. Because we have this nice h that I pulled out, I can then cancel it with the 1 in the denominator. And that's always going to be your last step. You will know that you're done simplifying your difference quotient if you have been able to cancel out the h's on the top and the bottom. And our final answer here is just 4a plus 2h minus 1. And that's your simplified difference quotient. So this is a formula now that represents the slope or the average rate of change of any points on this function. You give me the base point A and how far away H you want to go, and I can tell you the slope between those two points. So it's a very powerful formula because we've only done the computation once and we're able to figure out many, many different slopes. Let's try it again for a square root function. So again, we're going to start with our formula, f of A plus H minus f of a all over h. So the first thing we're going to do is change this input x to an a plus h. So under that radical, I'm just going to replace that x and get square root of a plus h with that plus 1 on the side. Now we're going to substitute in an a so that we can get f of a. So this becomes square root of a plus 1. We want the difference of all of these f of a's with all of these f of a plus h's. There's the difference, and now here's my quotient. Divide all that by h. So let's go ahead and distribute our negative across these parentheses. I can drop these parentheses in front. So square root of a plus h plus 1 minus square root of a minus 1. And you will get a little bit of canceling. Those plus 1's cancel out. And we have square root of a plus h minus square root of a all over h. Now it's not possible for me to cancel out the h's here because one's under a radical and one's not. So this looks like we're kind of stuck. It looks like we're not quite done yet, but I don't have any clue what to do. So the trick here, and it's it's kind of a nice strategy to remember whenever you're doing a problem with radicals. This is usually something that you're going to want to try to remember to do, and that is to use something called a conjugate. It's very similar to what we've done in the past when we rationalize denominators, when you have square roots and cube roots. We try to get rid of the radical in the denominator and move it up to the top. Well, on this problem, we're going to try to get rid of the radicals in the numerator and move them to the bottom by using the conjugate. So what is the conjugate? The conjugate is exactly this expression in the numerator. You want to use the part that has the radicals in it. It's exactly the same expression, but with the opposite sign in the middle. So the conjugate is going to be square root of a plus h plus square root of a. Now, to keep things balanced and equivalent to what I'm starting with, because I don't want to change my problem at all here, I'm going to multiply the numerator by this conjugate, but I'm also going to multiply the denominator by that conjugate as well. 
And that way, what I'm really multiplying right here by is just a fancy version of 1. So we're just changing our fraction into an equivalent form, but hopefully it's going to be a new form that's a little easier for us to work with. Now I like to put in parentheses around all these sums and differences to help reinforce that I need to FOIL or distribute. On the top, hopefully what you'll notice with the fact that we're using a conjugate is that when I do FOIL, this inner term will be a negative square root of a times square root of a plus h, and this outer term will be a positive square root of a times square root of a plus h. So those two inner and outer terms will cancel. So the only terms we're going to have left over would be the first times the first. Well, what's a square root of a plus h times a square root of a plus h? Well, that's the same thing as taking square root of a plus h and squaring it. And a square and a square root cancel each other out, so all we're going to get left is that stuff underneath the radical, that a plus h. So the first times the first just gives me a plus h. Now we need to do the last times the last. What's square root of a times square root of a? Square root of a squared. And the square and the square root cancel out, giving me just the a back. So again, we just end up with what's under that radical. And since it was a minus square root of a times a plus square root of a, we end up with a minus. So look at what we ended up with on top. The middle terms canceled out, and when I did first times first, I lost the radical. And when I did last times last, I lost the radical. So we get a very simple, clean numerator. Now what about the denominator? You could distribute the h across to both of these radicals, but I don't recommend it, and I'll show you why in just a moment. But for now, let's just copy that h and copy in parentheses that conjugate so we're not really doing anything to the denominator at all. We're just pushing these two terms together. Now this is why you don't want to distribute on the bottom, because if you look at the top, these a's cancel, and you're left with just an h on the top, and that h on the top is going to cancel with the h that we had in the bottom. And remember I said earlier that that will always be your last step. So once you cancel out those h's, you will know that you're done. Now be careful here. You have square root of a plus h plus square root of a left over, but it's in the denominator, so don't forget to put this underneath a 1. You have a factor of 1 left over. So our final answer is this fraction, 1 over square root of a plus h plus square root of a, and that's your simplified difference quotient. Okay, we're going to try one more very typical example, so you're going to have to be able to handle finding simplified difference quotients for polynomials like quadratics, for functions that have radicals like the square root that we just did, and for functions that are fractions like this one that we're about to do right now. So let's start off with our formula, f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. So I'm going to substitute in where this x is and I'm going to put in a plus h in its spot. So this fraction becomes 1 over a plus h minus 2. And now if I substitute in a for that x, this becomes 1 over a minus 2, and we're taking the difference between those two things. And all of this is over h. Now this is pretty messy. This has fractions within this bigger fraction. So that's called a complex fraction. So again, there's another nice strategy or trick that you want to use here to help you clean up this complex fraction. And the key here is to multiply by the common denominator on the top and on the bottom. So what would the common denominator be? Well, it's going to be whatever this denominator is times whatever this denominator is, since they don't match. And the h on the bottom, if you need to, you can think of that as being over 1, so it doesn't have any denominator to contribute. So your common denominator would just be a plus h minus 2, wrapped in parentheses, times a minus 2, wrapped in parentheses. And to keep this balanced and equivalent to what we started with, we're going to multiply by this on the top, but we're also going to multiply it by it on, on the bottom as well. 
So let's see what happens. Let's do a little bit of scratch work over here on the side. I'm going to take this first fraction times my common denominator. So if I take 1 over a plus h minus 2 times this common denominator, look at what happens. This denominator cancels with this factor, and what we're left with is this 1 and this leftover factor a minus 2. So we're just going to get a minus 2 when I do this whole fraction times my common denominator. Then I'm going to have my subtraction symbol, and now we're going to do that with this fraction times my common denominator. So if I do 1 over a minus 2 times my common denominator, this time it's the a minus 2's that cancel, so I'm left with 1 times a plus h minus 2, so that's what's going to be left over after I finish multiplying. And again, be very careful here. When you multiply, that leftover factor needs to be left in parentheses because remember we're subtracting all of this from all of this. So use parentheses a lot. Now how about the denominator? This does not have anything in the denominator that's going to cancel with either of these two factors. So on the denominator, you have left over the h, it's not going anywhere, and you have both of these factors from the common denominator because they aren't canceling anything out. So really the denominator is just all three of these pushed together. So this is what we ended up with. Now it still is kind of messy right now, but it's a single fraction. We no longer have fractions within fractions. So let's see what happens after this. We've got to distribute our negative across the top. I don't need the parentheses in the first set, so this is just an a minus 2. But I do need to distribute my negative across to here. So I would get a minus a, a minus h, and a plus 2. And all of this is over that stuff in the bottom. Don't bother distributing in the denominator because you want to leave that h out front so that hopefully it will cancel with an h that's left on the top. And just as luck would have it, we do get that because these a's cancel and these 2's cancel. And we're left with a negative h on the top over all this stuff on the bottom. And because the top and the bottom both have an h, we can cancel those out. That's going to be my last step. And my final answer is that negative 1 left on the top over a plus h minus 2 times a minus 2. So this whole big fraction is my answer. So this is your simplified difference quotient. Be able to calculate these for all different types of functions, ones that are quadratics, ones that have square roots, and ones that have fractions. Now let me just show you two last examples here using this answer that we just came up with. So what we just found out was that the simplified difference quotient for the function 1 over x minus 2 was this formula, negative 1 over a plus h minus 2, parentheses a minus 2. So what this next question is going to ask us to do is to actually find a specific average rate of change over a specific interval. So let's think about what this is saying right here for a moment. It's telling us to let a equal 4 and let h equal 0.5. Now remember what these a's and these h's represented. They re represent the base starting point and then how far away from that starting point you want to go. So if they're telling me that a is 4, that means the first point that I'm looking at is when x is 4. And if h is 0.5, then that means I want to go 0.5 away from that starting point. So I want to go up to 4.5. So we're trying to find the average rate of change on this interval. Now we could have just done that by 
finding the y values in our function using our functions formula, and then subtracting the y's and subtracting the x's. But if you'll notice down here in part b, it's going to ask us to do exactly the same thing, finding a slope or an average rate of change, but on a different interval. So then we'd have to find those y values, subtract those y's, subtract those x's, and find that slope. And instead of doing that process twice, what we're going to do is use all the work that we just came up with to find this simplified difference quotient, plug in the appropriate a and the appropriate h, and we'll be able to come up with what this average rate of change is just by using this formula once. Okay, so here's what we need to do. To find the average rate of change, we're just going to use this difference quotient formula and we're going to plug in what the A is that we're supposed to be using and what the H is. And on this first part, it's very obvious because they tell us exactly what to use for A and H. So I'm going to plug in 4 for my A, 0.5 for my H, and I'm using this formula that we worked so hard to come up with. And then A was 4, so we have this so far. Let's simplify. So we get negative 1 over 4.5 minus 2 times 2. So this is negative 1 over 2.5 times 2, which is negative 1 fifth. So the average rate of change on the interval 4 to 4.5 is negative one-fifth. Okay? So, if we look at our second example, we're going to now use the interval 3 to 3.01. So we're going to do exactly the same thing that we just did. Use this formula, negative 1 over a plus h minus 2 times a minus 2. Plug in what a represents, plug in what h represents, and then simplify. So if my interval is 3 up to 3.01, what's, what's the base starting point? What's A? Here it has to be that first number in that interval. It has to be that 3. The H, remember, is how far away from 3 you go. So if we're going up to 3.01, then our H has to be that 0.01. So all we have to do now is substitute in those numbers into this formula. So our average rate of change is going to be negative 1 over 3 plus 0.01 minus 2 times 3 minus 2. So we get negative 1 over 3.01 minus 2 times 1, and that's negative 1 over 1.01 times 1. And if we substitute that into our calculator to get a decimal here, negative 1 divided by 1.01 .01 is negative 0 0.9900, and that pattern continues. So here's our average rate of change on the interval 3 to 3.01. So instead of finding the slope multiple times using change in y's over change in x's, we used a single formula that we calculated earlier and just plugged in the appropriate A and the appropriate H. Okay, that concludes our lecture on increasing, decreasing, even, odd, and average rate of change. Good luck!